My family and I lost my dad last fall. He was 92, and he had a long and full life. And I miss him. At his memorial service, I gave his eulogy, along with dad's sister, his oldest granddaughter, and a dear family friend. I found it both easy and hard to eulogize my dad. Easy in that I loved him, admired many things about him, and knew he loved and was proud of me. And I had 61 years of material, a little more because I borrowed from his mother, his sister, and my older sisters. But writing dad's eulogy was hard in that I really wanted to tell the essence of who he was, how he lived. I've had the role of eulogizing other people in memorial services that I've conducted. I tell those they left behind that no words can hope to sum up a human being, a lifetime lived. But I still wanted to do that for my dad somehow. as I suspect others want to do for their loved ones, because they are no longer able to tell their own stories. I am a speaker for the dead. I was dead's speaker. I wanted to get his story right. I take the phrase speaker for the dead from a science fiction novel by Orson Scott Card. Speaker for the dead is the second novel in the series focusing on Andrew Wiggin, that novel's precursor was Ender's Game, a movie of which came out last year. In it, the last surviving member of an alien species contacts the lead character, Ender Wiggin. Ender had unwittingly wiped out the rest of the alien species, a xenocide. Though he did not realize what he was doing at the time, Ender feels responsible for the crime. So Ender tells the story of the aliens as the last survivor told it to him. He publishes it under the pseudonym, Speaker for the Dead. Everyone who reads the book learns that the aliens did not realize that humans were sentient beings when they attacked. After they discovered that we humans think and feel, they never attacked again. But humans, in their fear and anger, attacked the aliens' homeworld, destroying the entire species. After reading the speaker's book, everyone laments the loss of this intelli intelligent civilization. They condemn Ender. He also acts as his brother's speaker. He writes a second book under the pseudonym Speaker for the Dead. It gives a parallel but uniquely human perspective to the xenocide. The two books become classics and inspire the rise of a movement of speakers for the dead. Any citizen has the legal right to summon a speaker to mark the death of a family member. Speakers research the dead person's life and give a speech that attempts to speak for him or her. But here is what captured my imagination. Speakers describe the person's life as he or she tried to live it. They tell the whole truth about the person, their intentions, their troubles, their desires, not just their actions. The speech is not given in order to persuade an audience, not to praise, not to condemn, not even to forgive. It's a way to understand the person as a whole, including any flaws or misdeeds. In real life, we tend not to speak ill of the dead. Let me put your minds at ease. I have nothing bad to say about anyone who's died. But it is easy, once loved ones are gone, to idealize them. Much easier than when they are with us. One of my colleagues used to say this about memorial services. He always tried to avoid giving a eulogy that praised the deceased so lavishly that no one recognized him or her. <laughs> we are real people not perfect. If we tend to ignore any flaws or misdeeds after someone dies, we also tend to ignore what might cause those flaws or misdeeds 
especially where people are living. I think we can learn something from our relationship to those who have died. Something about all of us who are still living and how we want to live. What does it mean to get it right in telling anyone's story? What if we told the whole truth about ourselves and others? Tried to understand people as whole and complex? Knew not just the good and the bad and everything in between that they did in this world, but understood why they did what they did? What if we tried to understand what hurts and disappointments and despair cause us to behave badly when we do? What if we looked at everyone and asked first what we could do or could have done to help? What if we became speakers for the living as well as for the dead? In the novel, Zender Wiggins says, when you really know somebody, you can't hate them. Or maybe it's just that you can't really know them until you stop hating them. It's impossible to really understand somebody, what they want, what they believe, and not love them the way they love themselves. We cannot be speakers, truth tellers about the whole person without empathy. And we cannot empathize unless we are willing to put ourselves in someone else's shoes, at least as far as we can. To empathize, we have to be able to see other people in us and us in them. There are at least three varieties of empathy. Cognitive empathy means that we can understand what the other person thinks, see his point of view. This makes for good debaters, salespeople, negotiators, and con men. <laughs> On the other hand, people who have strengths in cognitive empathy alone can lack compassion. They get to see how you see it, but don't care about you. The next variety, emotional empathy, refers to someone who feels within herself the emotions of the person she's with. This creates a sense of rapport. It probably entails the brain's mirror neuron system, which activates our own circuits as we see the emotions of others. That's not the end of empathy. That lets us feel with the other person, but not necessarily feel for them. That's the prerequisite for compassion. It requires empathic concern. Empathic concern means we not only understand how the person sees things and feels things in the moment, but we also want to help them if we sense the need. A study of empathic concern in seven-year-olds found that those who showed the least concern when they saw their mother in distress were most likely to have a criminal record two, deca two decades later. Writer Ian Percy says, when we judge, other, we judge others by their behavior, we judge, judge ourselves by our intentions. In attempting to empathize, we're actually missing the point, Percy says, if we are judging at all. Because then we're more concerned with being knowledgeable, being right, or even being good than we are with actually feeling another person's reality. Let me tell you a story. It's an extreme example. Gary Gilmore, he murdered two young men in cold blood and then refused to appeal his death sentence. He was executed in Utah in 1977. His brother, Michael Gilmore, his younger brother, did an extensive search of his family's history to try to determine where things went wrong. Four brothers, of four brothers, Gary was the only outwardly violent one. Michael traces family secrets, extreme emotional neglect, religious rigidity, and bouts of physical abuse that his brothers endured back to his grandparents. Both sets of those grandparents rejected the two children who grew up to become Gilmore's parents. Michael shows, as well as any psychologist, the life history and possible development of an antisocial personality. 
the reader immediately knows that severe dysfunction is at the heart of this family. So it's not surprising to learn that the father, Frank Gilmore Sr., was a con man, a wanderer, an alcoholic, a brutal autocrat, and, abu and an abusive husband and father. If you'll forgive me, I'm going to complete the rest of this sermon sitting down. could move that podium. Is this okay? Can people see me? Thank you. Frank had many dark secrets, many of them criminal. Bessie, Gary's mother, was a Mormon, outcast from her family. Frank often disappeared without explanation for long stretches of time, although he sometimes took Bessie with him, even when she had three children in tow. He drank heavily, vented his considerable rage on his wife. Shortly after Gary was born, Frank decided that Gary was not his son. It seemed a way for him to detach from his son the way his own father had detached from him. There was little chance that Frank would feel much affection for Gary. When Frank's sons got older, he began to whip them with a belt much more severely than their various infractions warranted. The boys soon learned that no matter what they said or did, their father simply wanted to brutalize them, all the while insisting that they love him. Their mother did not protect them. She let them know that the ideal family was childless. Eventually, she began to beat them too as she was being beaten. Gary reacted with a rebellious streak. He acted out in school, tested his cur courage by running in front of trains, exploited and violated friends. He hung out with an antisocial crowd of boys. They engaged in petty crimes, burglary, theft, substance abuse. That landed Gary in reform school, where he became a more sophisticated criminal. By the age of 16, Gary was in jail. He finally turned to murder. In July of 1976, just after being paroled, on two consecutive nights, he killed two men in cold blood, apparently without any motive. Had he not been caught, he probably would have continued to kill, his brother Michael wrote. His chilling final words seemed to affirm his terrible legacy. There will always be a father. What is the truth about Gary Gilmore? What was his reality? Explanations are not excuses, but they are necessary when we want to tell the whole truth about any of us, how we came to be who we are. Hurt people hurt people. My dad's reality was vastly different. He always gave credit for his own happy and rewarding life to his parents and the loving home they created. That's true for me, too. One of the themes I told about my dad was that I never remember a time when he didn't look for the best in people and work to make the best of any situation. We learn how to live from each other. What is the truth about my dad? He was a constant encourager because his family encouraged him. Loved people, love people. I am convinced by this illustration from Buddhist teacher Thich Nhat Hanh. When you plant lettuce, if it does not grow well, you don't blame the lettuce. You look for reasons it is not doing well. Maybe it needs fertilizer or more water or less rain, less sun. You never blame the lettuce. Yet if we have problems with our friends or family, we blame the other person. But if we know how to take care of them, they will grow well like the lettuce. 
Blaming has no positive effect at all. Nor does trying to persuade using reason and argument. That is my experience. No blame, no reasoning, no argument, just understanding. If you understand and you show that you understand, you can love, and the situation will change." Close quote. Julio Diaz remembers being robbed on a subway platform in the Bronx. He said, so I get off the train. You know, I'm walking toward the stairs and this young teenager pulls out a knife. He wants my money. So I just gave him my wallet and told him, there you go. He starts to leave and he's wa as he's walking away, I say, hey, wait a minute. You forgot something. If you're gonna be out robbing people for the rest of the night, you might as well take my coat to keep you warm. So he's looking at me like, what's going on here? He asked me, why are you doing this? I said, well, I don't know, man. If you're willing to risk your freedom for a few dollars, then I guess you must really need the money. I mean, all I wanted to do was go get dinner. And if you really want to join me, hey, you're more than welcome. Look, you can follow me if you want. I just felt maybe he really needs help. So we go into the diner where I normally eat, and we sit down in the booth, and the manager comes by, the dishwashers come by, the waiters came by to say hi, you know. The kid was like, man, you know everybody here. Do you own the place? No, I just eat here a lot. But you're even nice to the dishwasher. I said, well, haven't you been taught that you should be nice to everybody? He said, yeah, but I didn't think people actually behaved that way. I just asked him in the end, what is it that you want out of life? He had a sad face. Either he couldn't answer me or he didn't want to. The bill came and I look at him. Look, uh, I guess you're going to have to pay for this bill. Because <laughs> you have my money and I can't pay for it. But if you give me my wallet back, I'll gladly treat you. He didn't even think about it. Yeah, okay, here you go. So I got my wallet back and I gave him $20 for it. I figure maybe it'll help him. I don't know. When I gave him the $20, I asked him to give me something in return, his knife. And he gave it to me. I figure you treat people right, you can only hope they treat you right. It's as simple as it gets in this complicated world. Just by helping kids learn, showing them what kindness and caring feel like. Orson Scott Card has Ender say that if we really understood people, we could not help but love them, feel loving kindness for them. And sickness and healing are in every heart Death and deliverance are in every hand. We can change the course of people's lives and our own in the process. I'll tell you what I want for myself. I want to be a speaker for the living as well as for the dead. But that means I really need to try to understand and feel what everyone else understands and feels. We don't get to not care about anyone. I want to know and feel their reality and then want to help. I really want to be on everyone's side. That's the challenge that speaks to me. It sounds like this. If I could stand in someone else's shoes, hear what they hear, see what they see, feel what they feel. Would I treat them differently? Blessed be.